Hey, Denon High School, this is Mr. Aiden, and this is the AP Chemistry Final Exam Review um, for our exam on Monday. And this podcast we're going to be taking a look at, this is part three, and we're going to be taking a look at equilibrium, we're going to be taking a look at reactions, and we're going to be taking a look at descriptive chemistry. And that should sort of finish us out with uh, the total review for the exam. So let's get to it. Uh, let's take a look at equilibrium. And if you see in the upper right-hand corner, we have... Um, that's a graph for an equilibrium. You can see when do we know we are at equilibrium? It's when the rates of the forward reaction and the rates of the backward reaction are the same, are constant. It's where the the rates are the same. And so we're going to be taking a look at this uh, this formula right here of the production of ammonia. And you can see it's an exothermic reaction. And the Kc for the reaction, we put the products on top in brackets with the coefficients go as exponents and the reactants go on the bottom. And we can also do a Kp for this reaction, which is the exact same thing, except make sure you use partial pressures for Kp. Don't get something like that wrong. Um, that is that easy. Now, Le Chatelier's principle says, if we add concentration to the reactants, it's going to shift it to the right, to the products. It's going to make more ammonia. Now, if you take away concentration of the reactants, it does the exact opposite. It produces more reactants then, produces more reactants. We could also raise the temperature. If it's exothermic, we know exothermic means heat is a product. So it's just the same thing. If we raise the temperature, it's raising the heat, which means it pushes it away from that heat. It's going to produce more reactants. It's going to shift it to the left. And also, if we de increase the pressure or decrease the volume, it's going to shift it to the right to the least number of moles, and that is Le Chatelier's principle. Um, something else we got to keep in mind is we can convert from Kp to Kc with a nice easy equation. Make sure you, you're, you're using the 0 0.0821 for your R, and your moles, your delta N, is your moles of your products minus your moles of your reactants. In this reaction, it would be 2 minus 4 which would be negative 4, and that would be the power of R times T. And last but not least, if you flip your reaction, what happens to our equilibrium expression? It gets flipped. It goes to the negative 1 power. If we divide all our coefficients by 2, our coefficients go as exponents, so it would be to the 1 half power. If we combine reactions, we have to do the product or multiply those two Ks together. Um, Let's take a look specifically about the Ka, Kb equilibrium, and they all are this general equation of Ha plus H2O. It's this Bronsted-Lowry equation, and you can see Bronsted-Lowry acids give away protons. They give away H+. Plus. And so this is our equilibrium expression for our Ka there, and, uh, and that is something that we should be able to get right. That's all actually on your equation sheet. Now, remember, primary topic says if you're given K and you're given the initial molarity for HA, you put your KA, you put your initial molarity on the bottom, and it's an X squared problem. Make sure you make a little note that you're going to assume the initial molarity minus X is really equal to the initial molarity. Now, if you're given initial molarity and percent association or pH, you're going to be finding for K. So remember our equation for percent association, it's x over the initial molarity. Or if we're given pH, we can find our x, which is our H+, plus, by doing 10 to the negative pH. Then you can plug it in the equation and put x squared up top, whatever you find for x. x squared goes up top and subtract it from your initial molarity because we can't assume here to find our Ka. And if you're given a common ion or a buffer, or if it's a titration problem before the equivalence point, we can use henderson hasselbach Or you can just plug in the A- minus in your equilibrium expression. But in any case, it, it throws out a nice pH. pH equals pK plus log of the conjugate goes on top. So if you're given something like sodium fluoride, put the fluoride up top. The acid goes on the bottom. If it's a titration problem, remember, put the moles of your conjugate, whatever you're titrating, your base up top, put the difference, whatever is subtracted, on the bottom. And also, keep in mind the pH of different salts. Take a look at sodium acetate. See the acetate ion? That is a conjugate base. 
That comes from the acetic acid. That's a conjugate base. So that is basic. If you take a look at the NH4Cl, the NH4 plus is a conjugate acid. So that's acidic. But if your conjugate, like NaCl, the Cl minus, if that comes from a strong ester base, you have a neutral salt. Let's take a look at uh, equilibrium for KSP, for KSP, and if you're given KSP for these guys, you don't need any molarities because in the top equation, it's just going to be an x squared problem. You're just going to square root. If you're given KSP for the second one, you're going to do a 4x cubed because it's x times 2x squared, which is 4x cubed. So you're going to divide by 4, do the cubed root. Now if you're given molar, molar solubility, which is x, or like the lead concentration, you can do the 4x cube with that second reaction. You can square it with that top reaction. But remember, molar solubility is x. If you're given something like NaCl for the second reaction, or even the first reaction, that's called a common ion. Put whatever that concentration is in your formula, and you're solving for less x's there. Remember, if you take away water or you add water to, to a saturated solution, Concentration does not change. It's independent of volume. But if you add a common ion, like the chloride ion, if that concentration goes up, the lead or the silver will go down to compensate for that. But if you add or take, a, take away water, nothing changes. And last but not least, watch out for Q problems. Remember, if they give you everything, if they give you concentrations, if they've given you K or you've solved for K already, what you want to do is a Q problem, which means you want to find out the individual concentrations. You can do M1V1 equals M2V2 for that, because you're basically diluting it. Take your milliliters, multiply by your molarity, divide by your total. Take your milliliters, multiply by your molarity, divide by your total. Find out what that is. If it's greater, that means you're going to precipitate. You have enough concentration of your ions to precipitate. If it's less, guess what? Not going to precipitate. Let's take a look at uh, like a KCKP problem. Uh, I actually think it, it might be a KCKP problem this year. And all, all the time in KCKP problems, they give you the initial molarity, and they give you something at equilibrium, because we're going to use ice. Now, if they give you something, um, an initial molarity, and at equilibrium, that means using ice, you can find out what x is. Once you find out what x is, you know what all your equilibrium concentrations are. Guys, I would suggest not doing moles here. I would suggest doing everything in molarity because then you can plug it in your equilibrium expression and you can end up getting your Kc or your Kp or whatever you're looking for. Remember, if it's Kp problem, guys, you're prob probably going to be using Pivnert for this as well. Let's take a look at reactions. Um, and you can even take um, look at your reactions one by one and you can you can guess what it's going to be when, when, whenever we have two elemental substances together it's going to be a combination reaction which is also an oxidation reaction like this calcium and oxygen gas giving us calcium oxide why is it an oxidation reaction because calcium starts with a zero charge oxygen starts with a zero charge and then when it's an ionic compound lattice energy it is going to have a plus two and a negative two which means we have Leo and Ger going on. What happens when we put a metal with water? If we put a metal, like an alkali metal with water, we get a base and a boom. Just like when we put sodium with water, we get a base, sodium hydroxide, and the boom, the H2 gas. And But guys, always ask yourself, do I need to split up? Is my, my base strong or weak? If it's alkali metal with a hydroxide, split it up. If it's an alkaline earth metal, keep it together. Here we have a metal oxide in water. What happens when we put a metal oxide in water? I get a base. No boom. Here I have calcium oxide in water and what do I get? Calcium hydroxide. That's weak because it's in the second column. So keep it together. Keep it together. If I have a non-metal oxide in water, I'm going to get an acid. So just combine your your H2s and your S's, or if it's N's and your O's, and just take a look, see if you need to split it up, see if it's strong. If you need to split it up, put it in the ions. Here's a, a next group of reactions. We have ammonium carbonate is heated. This is one we have to know. Ammonium, what's going to come out? Ammonia. Carbonate, what's going to come out? 
carbon dioxide. And that's this NH42CO3, and what's going to come out is ammonia, carbon dioxide, and water. We have hydrogen peroxide placed in light, or maybe catalyst is with it. And this is actually an oxidation reduction reaction as well. Um, H2O2 breaks up into H2O and O2. And this is just like uh, if you take a look, the oxygen at the beginning has a negative 1 charge. At the end, he's got a negative 2, and he's got a 0 charge. So the oxygen actually both oxidized and reduced. Potassium chloride is heated. This is the gummy bear experiment, and it changes into potassium chloride and oxygen gas. And why did we see all that big fire? Because oxygen gas ignites that flame. We have something like a, a hydrate, copper sulfate, penta, penta means 5, 5 waters. Copper sulfate, 5H2O, will break up into copper sulfate plus 5H2O. That's a pretty easy reaction right there. Here's some more reactions. We got some acid base reactions here. Um, the first one is a strong acid, hydrochloric acid, and a strong base hydroxide. So you basically just make water. This is our neutralization reaction. Now whenever you have a weak acid like hydrofluoric acid, you've got to keep that together. And when you put it with a hydroxide, it's a Bronsted-Lowry reaction, which means the HF gives away a proton, gives away the H+, plus, so that you have a conjugate acid, H2O, and a conjugate base, fluoride. And you can probably see why NaF would be a basic salt because it's got a base like fluoride in it. What happens whenever we put a, a carbonate with a strong acid? That's going to we're going to produce a gas. Um, we're going to produce carbon dioxide. So that is the the H plus plus the CO three minus two, and it becomes carbonic acid, which basically breaks down into carbon dioxide and water. What happens when we put ammonium with a strong base? We're going to produce a gas as well. We're going to produce ammonia gas. Okay. So NH4 plus plus OH minus, and that's again just like a Bronsted-Lowry acid base reaction. Here are my last bits of reactions here. Whenever we have two solutions together, you got to, and that not acids and bases, got to think about a precipitation reaction. So remember what doesn't precipitate, alkali metal ions, nitrates, acetates, ammoniums will not precipitate with each other. And so here I have lead plus 2, plus 2I minus, gives you, giving you PBI2, an ionic solid. Whenever you have a solid, liquid, or gas with a solution, go to your cheat sheet. Go to your, your, uh, all your redox reduction reactions and flip one of the reactions, combine them together. So here I have zinc plus 2Ag plus, giving you zinc plus 2, plus 2Ag, and you can figure out whether that's spontaneous or not through my electrochem stuff. Same thing here, I have liquid bromine plus a solution. and That will be a similar reaction, but the one that you flipped is still going to be an oxidized reaction here, and it's going to be Br2 plus 2I minus, giving you the bromide ion and iodine. Then we have uh, two complex ion reactions. The one's very, very uh, uh, common that we see is boron trichloride with excess concentrated ammonia. Guys, Every single one of these complex ions or coordination complexes are Lewis acid bases. And here in this first one, you can tell who my Lewis base is. It's ammonia. And what do Lewis bases do? They give away electrons. Because NH3 has those extra unshared pairs, they give away electrons. BCL3, which is a Lewis acid, accepts those electrons. And so Bronsted Lowry's acids give away protons, H+, plus, Lewis bases give away electrons. And the last one is excess hydrochloric acid is placed in copper 2 chloride. Here I have copper plus 2. Always put your metal ion first, which is your Lewis acid. Always put your Lewis base next. Remember our, our, our Lewis bases are ammonium, ammonia, chloride, hydroxide, and cyanide, Cn-. minus. And take that charge, double it, and then on the on the chloride, balance it, and then balance your your uh, ions there. All right. For descriptive chemistry, we basically in every descriptive chemistry problem, you see five common qualitative observations that you want to take a look at each and every time. The first one is what makes a colored substance. When you have a partially filled d orbital, you have a 
colored substance. If you have something like zinc, which is totally full, it's going to be white or an alkali metal or something like that. What does or does not dissolve in water? And so things like as we know, nitrates, alkali metal ions, they always dissolve in water. And so the things that precipitate often are like uh, lead or silver with halogens or like phosphates. They precipitate with a lot of things. Um, how do you dissolve a precipitate? You make a complex ion or a coordination complex. You put excess concentrated of a Lewis base to, to dissolve that precipitate. Um, making a precipitate, again, it, it really 2, 3, and 4, very much the same thing. How do you make a precipitate? And then last but not least, production of a gas by a strong acid or strong base. That's that carbonate and a strong acid gives you carbon dioxide. Ammonia, ammonium, and a hydroxide, strong base, gives you ammonia. Let's take a look at the, some of the descriptive chemistry we have to know. Copper sulfate is going to be blue, the blue solution. Iron, iron plus 2, iron plus 3 is going to be an orange solution. Permanganate, that MnO4, is going to give us a purple color, a bright, bright purple color, but manganese plus 2 is going to be pink. We often like to do titrations with that. Chromate, which is CrO4 minus 2, is going to be a nice yellow color, and dichromate, Cr2O7 minus 2, I wouldn't be caught dead in an orange color like that, so dichromate. Silver chloride is a precipitate. It's a common white precipitate. Lead iodide is a common precipitate, which is bright yellow. And anything with like a sulfide, you can assume that it's going to be a black precipitate. Some of the gases we have to know, carbon dioxide gas, the gas that you breathe out, is colorless. It extinguishes flames. That's what we put in our um, fire extinguishers. Nitrogen gas, it makes up 78% of the atmosphere. And guess what? It extinguishes flames as well. Hydrogen gas gives us that boom, that whoop, that it's colorless, but it explodes. and It's very light and very fast. Oxygen gas, colorless, but as we know, the only thing you need for a combustion reaction is oxygen gas. And last but not least, that deadly brown gas, nitrogen dioxide, because it's got that free radical, that extra lone electron. Guys, hope that helped out. Um, that's equilibrium, descriptive chemistry, and reactions, and... Uh, Good luck, study up for Monday, and go at it, all right? Thanks, guys.